I'm going to speak this morning on a subject called the sin unto death, found in the book of 1 John chapter 5. You'd be surprised how many different views there are on this one little simple portion of Scripture. And I'll have to admit right up front, I'm not 100% that mine is correct. <clears throat> That's why you're going to read the verses and you're going to study the Scriptures and uh, you're going to come out with what you believe it might be. But hopefully these notes <clears throat> will help a little bit. So, first of all, take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. You will remember last week we started off in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. Well, lo and behold, we're going to do it again today since y'all did such a good job last week. Let me ask you a question. You've been to work. You come home. Little Johnny, 10 years old, comes running up to you. And you say, Johnny, how have you been doing today? And he says, Daddy, I've been doing great. I got an A in school. <clears throat> I behaved on the bus. When I got home, I, I did all my homework, and I obeyed my mother, and uh, everything is just wonderful, and it's so good to see you, Dad. And then Daddy says, well, come with me, Johnny. Let's go to your room, and I want to spank you just for general principle. <laughs> now, would you, would you spank a child that was so nice and kind and sweet and respectful and you're just going to just spank them just to, for no reason. Now, remember, now we have a heavenly father who really knows how to love his children. Do you believe that God gets up in the morning and looks over the banister of heaven and looks down there and he sees you and says, boy, have I got it out for you today. I know you deserve it. So I'm going to go ahead and just beat the tar out of you from morning till night. Wouldn't that be wonderful to get up every day knowing that your heavenly father was just going to beat you for no reason, spank you for no reason, punish you, and you don't even know why? Have you ever spanked your child without telling them why they're being spanked? Now, don't answer that. You probably have. But I know I have been whooped at times, and I've been totally innocent. I sense a wave of doubt as it sweeps across the room. But my daddy used to just whoop me just for general principle because he knew I did something. He didn't know what it was, but he knew I was guilty of something. Now, my sisters, they, he didn't do that with them. Only the firstborn son. And I wish I had been the lastborn son. But he would just beat the tar out of me, and I hadn't done anything wrong. I did not deserve it. And I can recall some of those moments. I've said this before. My daddy wasn't a fisherman, but we went on a few whaling expeditions. <laughs> but you've got a heavenly father who loves you so much, and I don't believe my heavenly father just gets up and starts beating on disobedient or obedient children. Now, disobedient children, he may have to call you in and uh, <clears throat> tan your hide a little bit, but I don't believe God whoops us without telling us what it's for, chasing us for no reason at all. So I want to talk to you about the, the sin unto death. But first of all, I want to read these two little statements that I wrote here because I think it will help you to understand where I'm coming from. So let's look at the uh, little paragraph there. How do we distinguish between those who sin unto death and those who do not? Remember now, we're talking about believers. Our prayers can never override the will of God. Even though God tells us to pray according to his will and uh, whatsoever we ask, he will do, but it's always within his will. Whatsoever you ask the Father in my will, according to my will. So that's why we study the word of God so that we can understand the will of God so we can uh, discern the things that we should pray for, not only concerning ourselves, but also for one another. Because prayer is a powerful thing. And God tells us throughout the scriptures, pray, pray, pray. And all of the great men of the Bible, they always prayed. And Jesus, when he was here, he prayed. So there's got to be something to this prayer life of ours where you're talking to the Lord. But when you talk to the Lord, you should expect something from the Lord. 
especially whenever we're making requests unto God. We're asking God to do something, either for us or for someone else. So our prayers can never override the will of God or the will or desire of a man. In other words, we can't take away his will by praying because people will have their own will to make in choices and decisions. And so we cannot override those things. We can appeal and appeal to the authority that's over them that God would do something for them. Remember now, picture me up here with a nice, great, big old umbrella in my hand. Under this umbrella is the will of God. Outside of the umbrella is not the will of God. So under the umbrella where we have the protection of God, the will of God, and how he can lead and guide us, and we can have all kinds of freedom to move around under this big old giant umbrella called the will of God. But sometimes as children of God, we want to get on the outside of God's protection, outside the will of God. And when we do, you have moved yourself away from the protection of the Lord. It's not like God has to, you know, from heaven, zap me so that I, ah, you did that, boom, you're dead, you're dead. He doesn't kill everybody who steps outside of his will. But whenever you choose voluntarily to step outside of the will of God, then you may be moving yourselves outside of the wisdom of God, the protection of God, and therefore God can remove his protection from you that you suffer the consequences of your own natural de decisions. I hope you understood that. The next thing is, I never pray for God to bless rebellion, but I do ask God to chasten for correction. So there are children of God that don't always obey what God's word says. So I don't ask God, get them, God, strike them dead. Now, they did that in the Old Testament, but I don't do that today. I don't. But I do ask God not to bless them, but to chasten and for the purpose of correcting them so that they can get back into the will of God. Are you understanding me so far? Good deal. We'll move right along. Look at the next statement. Although all men will die in this physical body, there are some sins that produce physical death. And there are some sins that do not produce physical death. The main question is, does this, the chastening of the Lord, ever bring physical death in order to shut down his life earlier than it could have? In other words, you ever hear people make this statement, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. You ever hear that? When it's your time to go, that's it. And yet doesn't the Bible say, even in the scriptures that were read this morning from the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6, when he says to do all of these things, heart, mind, body, and soul, if you'll do all of these things, that you may have eternal life. No, it didn't say that. That your days may be long upon the earth. That your life can be extended. And so there is a possibility that our lives can be long. He even tells in the book of Ephesians where he talks about the children of God. Obey your parents that it may be long your days upon the earth. A promise of living longer. Now it doesn't mean that you're not going to, some people die, but it's a general principle. And there's lots of these in scripture. But God can intervene in anyone's life at any given time. It's appointed unto every man wants to die and after this to judgment. But we do know that Enoch didn't die. Well, who made that first roll in the start with? Well, God did. Can he suspend it if he wants to? He's God. Isn't God sovereign enough to give me a free will? Now, there's a lot of people who say, no, he can't do that. God is sovereign, but he can't give me a free will. Anyway, you've got a problem with that. So God gives you and I choices to make in our life. Now, look at the next statement. Number one there, remember, one incident may be a trial to one person, a temptation to another, a chasten to another, and a warning to another. 
The same thing that can happen to me, that can happen to you, could be a testing to me. It may be a chastening for me. It may be a warning. But you see, people are different stages of their Christian life. And God may use different things to wake us up, to challenge us. You're not living your life totally without God being aware of who and where you are and what you and I are doing. So we do have God intricately involved in our lives. You may not discern it. We often call everything an accident, don't we? But I don't know with God, are there accidents? God's, oh man, I didn't know that was going to happen. Is it something that we call an accident, something we didn't plan? I fell down the stairs. Did you do it on purpose? Oh, yes. What happened? I broke both legs. So you plan to do that? Well, generally, no. So we call it an accident. It's interesting that these Calvinists, that talks about everything is the will of God. And then they get insurance to override the will of God. But anyway, we'll move right along. In Acts chapter 5, but first of all, before we go there, I want us now to take a look there at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And then it adds another statement, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That means to continue to believe and to believe in other things outside of just having eternal life. So that's why he says, and this is the confidence in verse 14. In verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So we have to know if we ask according to his will. So that's where your discernment comes in. Discerning the will of God. Studying the word of God so that you can discern the will of God, so that you can make better promises, or I should say better decisions for your life because you want better results from your decisions. Don't you always want to make the right decision and get the best results from that decision? Well, I would think that would be a normal desire of all of us. And then he says in verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin and not unto death. Now, you have to admit, boy, this is really interesting. What does it mean? I don't know. Well, I got an idea. But I know he's talking to believers, those who have trusted Christ as Savior. And it's written to give us confidence. And it lets us know that this confidence that we have is that God hears our prayers if we ask according to his will. And that there are people who can commit some sins that doesn't produce death. And there's those who can produce sins that will lead to death. And this is talking to believers. Now, I can apply it in many different ways. But I want to try to explain some things to you that I think would help. So first of all, let's take a look there in Acts in chapter 5. Now, we will go right according to these verses I got listed here, but I'd appreciate it if you don't jump the gun, which some of you do. Acts chapter 5. And you'll notice this in Acts chapter 5. This is on page 1154. <clears throat> 1154 in a church Bible. Now, here are two people that were in the church. We believe they were believers doing something for the church. There was others that were doing this, and they did it too. God didn't kill them, but here's a man and a wife, and God just zapped them. Took him out of here. I had a man email me, and he says, Mr. Arnold. Now, there's somebody on there that calls me Ralphie. 
And there's some who call me Yankee, but there's a few that call me Ralphie. And if they want to call me Ralphie, I guess it's all right. But here's two people who have their names written in Scripture. In verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. Ah, scheme. Collusion. You ever heard that word before? <laughs> and kept back part of it and bought a certain part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Who did they lie to? They lied to God. Tried to deceive the church. Tried to deceive Peter. But the Holy Spirit told Peter what they did. Does God see everything that people do? Does he know your motives? Knows why you do what you do. Does God really know why you're here today? You wanted to come to see today if I still had my goatee. <laughs> yeah, you didn't. Okay. Now, when he makes this statement here, you lied to God. In other words, look what he says here in verse 5. Ananias, bearing or hearing of these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these words. When it says that he fell down, what, what did he do? Oh, he stumbled? What happened to him? He died. So can God's children die because of sin? There are sins that can produce death. Now, I don't necessarily know every sin that commits you know, a person to death, but there is such a thing caught in the Scriptures. And we can go through the Old Testament and there's a whole bunch because when you stop and think about it, about a king named Saul... And he died because of his rebellion to God. Uh-huh. That's in there. Anyway. And the young men arose, wound him up, <laughs> carried him out, and buried him. I don't even wound him up. Like the little east, <laughs> the little bunny that's right. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's not what it's talking about. That means that they wrapped him up. And isn't it amazing that the guy died <laughs> and he was buried before his wife ever came in? Maybe she wanted to have some last words. Didn't get a chance. And so he says here, by the, in, <clears throat> in verse 7, and it was about the space of three hours, his wife walks in. Now her husband's already been buried. Now you're talking about moving on the ball. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. What, think, what do you think happened to her? She died too. So is it in the Bible where somebody did something wrong and died for it? I had a man write me, you can't show me one verse in the Bible that says God ever killed any of his children. Well, remember, he only takes the flesh birth. He can't kill the new birth. So none of God's children ever go to hell. None of God's children really never die. Because Christ says, when you believe in me, you shall never die. And if you die, yet shall you live. But he's talking about two births. Now, the one that dies is that flesh bird, but it takes us out of this world and just lets us get into the next one. See, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to leave here to get there. Now, if God answered everybody's prayer concerning those that get sick, Lord, make everybody well, and you shall have whatever you want. Now, I know it's not God's will to keep everybody here forever. I don't want to stay here forever. So there's some prayers that God will not answer. Why? Because it's contrary to his word. Now, get the scripture here. Look at Acts chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 8. Stephen's was a new elected deacon. He was a good man. He was a godly man. The Bible says that's what he was. So in verse 8, And Stephen's full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. Was he a good man? 
doing good things. You ought to see, he preached one great sermon. As far as we know, this is the only sermon he preached. But he preached a great sermon. So now look in chapter 7. Chapter 7 and verse 51. Look what he said about these people he was preaching to. I have some people say, you know, you should, you should always try to bring comfort to people. When people come to church, never ruffle any feathers. <laughs> they came to the wrong church. You're supposed to make everybody feel good. And some churches don't even talk about sin because that makes people feel bad. You know, that just makes people feel bad. Make me feel good. Ah, uh, oh, I feel better now. And always smiling. Well, there's sometimes, you know, not everything's worth smiling about. Uh, give what he said in verse 21. Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised. That's why I had to get my neck fixed. I had a stiff neck, and I didn't want to be no stiff neck. So now, see, I can turn my head a little bit. Now, what, was it worth it? See, now I praise the Lord. So he's not talking to me here. <laughs> ye do always resist the Holy Spirit and your fathers, so do you. And so he was landed on the line and hitting right between the eyes. And so because he preached such a great sermon, a good godly man, well, God's not going to let somebody do him wrong, right? Because he's doing right, he's serving God, so therefore... He's invincible, right? Now, what, 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 what he said? Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed their teeth on him. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon the Lord and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What do you think happened to him? Well, he died. Well, God's not going to let people who are doing right die, is he? What you read the scriptures. People that did right, they still die. <clears throat> you can do right and still suffer for it. And don't take it for granted. Everybody who gets sick, well, they must be out of the will of God. Everybody that dies, they're out of the will of God. Well, lo and behold, everybody dies out of the will of God then because everybody dies. No, discerning the truth of what God's word says. And there's some things that God says in one verse that enlightens another verse and helps you to understand this principle of life that we're living because you're going to have things happen in your life and you're going to wonder whether or not, <clears throat> is that because of something that I did? Did I deserve this? Isn't it true that sometimes when things go wrong in your life, you're thinking, I must have sinned. I wonder what I did wrong. You ever had your kids go wrong? I must not have raised them right. Nah, don't judge too fast. Give them time. When they get some kids, you'd be surprised how they wind up teaching the kids what you taught them. It all depends on what time we want to judge something, and we don't have all the facts in the case. But look at the next thing I want to show you. Look in chapter 9 and verse 1. Saul, who later became the great apostle Paul and wrote about 14 books in the Bible. No, for 13 for sure. But he says in verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. That, that means to take their life. He tried to ruin the church. He did a lot of wicked things. But he did what he did because he thought he was doing the will of God. But the only thing was, he wasn't doing the will of God. But he thought he was doing the will of God. And look at the damage that he, he did. And yet, God could have taken his life. But God, I believe, let him hear the gospel. And even though God had a purpose for his life, he had to still trust Christ as Savior. And he did so, and he believed. And God used him in a great and wonderful way. But here's God's children. God allowed that man to kill his children. But you see, absent from the body is present with the Lord. They still went to heaven. But God allowed a wicked man to do something wrong to his children. And as you live your life, you're going to suffer being defrauded. Things are going to happen. You're going to get sued sometimes. People are going to do wrong to you. And you're going to have health problems. You're going to have financial problems. You're going to have every problem that anybody else has. Sooner or later, if you live long enough. And you're going to always wonder, I mean, why, why, why? 
Isn't that the question we always ask, why? Look in chapter 14. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, and uh, look there in verse 19. <clears throat> in verse 19, the apostle Paul went to preach <laughs> in Galatia here, and lo and behold, he must be a god. Well, this idea about him being a, a god changed quickly. Now they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill their god. But we'll just jump down here to verse 19. And there was thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Now you ought to read the things that are mentioned in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11 about what Paul went through. And God let people try to kill him, stone him, all kinds of things that happened to him. Have you ever wondered, I'm trying to serve the Lord the best I can, and everything's going wrong. Well, whoopee-doo, what did you expect? Well, I thought being blessed is going through life without any problems. Well, really? You're talking about heaven. That's not the way it is here. Did you know to have all of your needs met is just as trying as having none of them met? Because your tr faith is on trial. And God is going to try your faith. Now look at this next thing. Here in Acts chapter 14 where he says he would be killed. We know that and believe that according to 2 Corinthians in chapter 12. He said I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell. But such a one was caught up into the third heaven. We believe that's what happened to Paul. Even though they wanted to kill him. God used that to show him things that no man had ever seen and come back to the earth and live. And then God put a thorn in his flesh to make things worse for him, lest he be exalted above measure that he was somebody that uh, he shouldn't think that way. So God had to humble him all the days of his ministry. You say, well, why would God do that? Because he'd be lifted up with pride. Pride destroys every person. When you think more about yourself, than you do about the, what the Word of God says. When you get to think, well, I don't need God, I don't need church, I don't need the Bible. I don't need... No, you've you, you got it all nailed down. You can handle everything all by yourself. You fool. That's a fool. And somebody told me, when is April the 1st? When is April the 1st? When? Oh, atheist holiday. A fool had said in his heart, there was no God. April Fool. Anyway, we'll move right along. I thought it would go over better than that, dear Bob, but it, it didn't. All right, but anyway, Galatians chapter 1. Look over there very quickly. The book of Galatians. Galatians in chapter 1. Look what Paul had to say. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. Here he is telling a little bit about the way he was before he ever trusted Christ as a Savior. He says, For you have heard of my conversation or my behavior, my testimony, in time past, in the Jews' religion, because he was a religious man, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. This is what I did. Now, God had to do a work in his life. Have you ever think sometimes you have to hit somebody over the head with a two before. I have to picture in my mind, you know, I'm like a lumberman, and I got a whole stack of two befores up here. And when y'all come to church, I'd like to get one of them and just knock on you over the head. Oh, that got that person. And then I reach over and get another one, and I got him knocked out in the head. He said, why are you doing that? Well, because they went to sleep on me. No, I'm just joking. I had one man get up in one service, and he started walking out of the church. I says, where are you going? He said, I'm going home to, to shave. I said, why didn't you shave before you came? He said, I did. <laughs> but anyway, not everybody sees everything the same way. And sometimes you can prejudge things that happen in somebody else's life. And sometimes you can look at somebody and they're going through the trials and tribulations. Oh, I know what they did. You don't really know. You guess. But did you know there's a, a warning in the scripture, uh, like in the book of Luke, about the one 
Pharisee that says, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like those other ones. And they look down their long, fair silk of nose. Boy, I'm glad I'm not like that. I'm glad I'm not like that. I'm so holy. I go to church all the time, and I pray, and I give. Man, am I holy. And another man just says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because he, he just knew he was a sinner. And there are some people who don't think, well, I'm glad I'm not that bad. I'm not I'm that bad, but I'm not that bad. And they just kind of prejudge everybody else. You better watch that. Because there's verses in the Bible about people who do that. Lock those doors. No. Now look at this. Look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now you need to know these verses are in the Bible because they will help you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says you were born of God and your body becomes the temple of God. See, God doesn't live here in this church. I've seen some people say, don't church, look quiet, be holy. So why we gotta be holy, quiet? We might wake up God. <laughs> he doesn't live here. But how do I know God is here? I brought him. He lives inside of me. My body is the temple of God. Look what he says there in verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Your body is the temple of God. And if you defile that body, and a lot of people have died way before their time. They have killed that body with alcohol and drugs and doing things they should not do and running with the wrong people at the wrong time, robbing banks, doing all kinds of things. Next thing you know, they, they used to call it AIDS. But there's, there's crimes, sins that can be committed against the body. And a lot of people have gotten, you know, diseases of the body because of sex with people they're not supposed to be with. And there's a price to pay. And they die early. But if you know Christ is your Savior, you can't sin against the body and get away with it. Now God talks about, yes, there's a word prazo. Poeo, not one single act. But prazo, to habitually committing certain sins over and over and over again. And you can destroy that body that you have. And you have to be very careful. So he says, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just briefly. I want to show you how uh, the church doing what's right, it became a blessing. In verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. So it wasn't something that was just a casual thing. Was This was commonly reported. As it, not, as it not so much as named among the Gentile <clears throat> that one should have his wife's um, a father's wife, where are, you are puffed up and not rather mourn. Why? Because it's wrong. That he that hath done this deed might be taken from among you. In other words, taken out. You say, I don't know if that's what it said. Well, uh, you, if you look down here, let me for For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so do done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, it's talking about this church, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the what? Of the flesh. Uh, that's dead. So God can remove his hand of protection when you decide to live outside of that little umbrella called the will of God. And so whenever you move outside that realm, then I don't pray God bless that person because I don't want God to bless that person in his rebellion. I pray God chasten the person for the purpose of correction. Put a hedge of thorns around that individual. So that whatever he does or she does, it pricks them and makes them get back under that element. So you can always pray for everyone 
within the will of God. And those that are in the will of God, they still get sick. And they still get tired and weak. And they still die. But it won't be because of chastening of the Lord. Or I should say uh, rebellion. So you can serve the Lord and suffer for it. And you can be rebellious and suffer for it. That's why in the book of Peter he talks about it is better to suffer for doing right than to suffer for doing wrong. Doesn't it say that? It's in there. So there's choices that we can make. So when I go home to be with the Lord, I want it to be because he's ready for me. Not because I had to be taken home against God's will because I was rebellious. I want to serve the Lord all the days of my life. Now, that's why these scriptures that are written in the Word of God are so important for us. But what I want you to see, though that's what they were prayed to take him home, that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord, this is what God wanted the church to do. But now take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians in chapter 1. Now this is an important tag on that verse of that incident. And you'll notice here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and look in verse 1, he's referring now back to the time when he told them as a church what to do about the brother that sinned against God. But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I made you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? but the same which is made sorry by me. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you, all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, now this is Paul's feelings, because, you see, it doesn't mean that Paul doesn't love the person. You love the person, but not what they were doing, and the testament was having for the church. So he says this, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye should know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted by many. In other words, the church praying for the individual woke the person up. They correct the problem. Now that person has corrected the problem. Forgive the person. Now pray for the person. Less. So in verse 7, so that contrary wise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. See, sometimes you step outside that little umbrella of protection. And God's people are supposed to pray that God can correct that person or chasten that person for the purpose of correction because you want them to get back so they can commit a sin that is worthy of death. But if they'll correct the problem, they don't have to die. Did you realize, and I'll show you this in just a minute, this is such an important lesson to remember because every one of us, sooner or later, somewhere along the line, will have to face it for ourselves or someone we know and love because not all of God's children all serve the Lord to the same degree, do they? Yet we want them to, but discerning how to pray is very, very important. So he says up here in verse 8, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Now, Without 1 Corinthians, we wouldn't have a clue what he's talking about here. But we do have Corinthians, and so we do know. And he says in verse 9, For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things, and learning how to forgive an individual who steps outside of the boundary of the will of God. So that's why he says in the book of Galatians, he says, Ye which are strong, seek to restore them that are weak. So that means you have to know, why are they weak? Well, because they're walking in the flesh. See, strong believers don't walk in the flesh. They walk in the spirit. Weak believers can walk in the flesh. 
and not the spirit. So those who are strong are supposed to encourage and pray for the other individual. Now look at the next scripture I want you to see. In the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, turn there, 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, just turn to your left a couple pages. These are verses that we generally read just about every time we have communion service, which will be next week. But I want you to see a couple of verses here with me. You'll notice there in verse 28, there were individuals in the church that were coming together, but they were getting drunk. And they had a lot of problems in the church, and they were not correcting anything. So you can't get right for somebody else, and somebody else can't get right for you. So he says, let, examine yourself. See there in verse 28, but let a man, the individual, examine his neighbor. And what we do? Well, I'm not as bad as, boy, I'm glad you're there. <laughs> I'm glad you're really bad because that doesn't make me look so bad. No, he says, let a man examine himself, so let him drink of that, or eat of that bread and drink of that uh, cup. And for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Judgment to himself. Then you see there in verse 30, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Three different things. But you'll notice that I have here in the notes. I want you to look at it very quickly. One is examine yourself. Two, judge yourself. You've got to correct it, right? Three, confess to God. That means own up to it. This is what I did. The fourth thing, forsake the sin. And that's where you have First John one nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unright. That is one of the things that you do. Why do you confess it? Because I examine myself. I've judged myself that it was wrong. And now I confess it to God. And now the last thing is forsake the sin. Now look at the words under result because this is so important. When we have here, he is faithful, talking to God now. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And according to 1 Corinthians 11.31, we will not be judged. All right, look up here. I'm God and i got a great big old umbrella. And there's room here for everybody. It's called the will of God. And you've got a lot of freedom within the will of God to make a lot of decisions between right and right. You see, this is right and that's wrong outside of the will of God. So you've got a lot of decisions that you can make. But when you step outside of the will of God and you walk in the flesh and you wind up doing things that you know is ungodly and it's wrong, you can do one of two things. You can examine yourself because you know God could take you on home. And there are sins to be taken home and there are sins that once they have been confessed to God because you examined yourself, judged that it was wrong, and corrected the problem, then God says, you will not be judged. You don't have, so there are sins that are not under death. Sins that the Christian has made right concerning. And I believe that is also taught in the book of 1 John, and I believe that's a good possibility. This is what those verses are talking about. So when we see those that are outside of the will of God, we're to pray that God will use chastening in their life to bring them back to the Lord. It's not because you hate people, because you love them. And you know the greatest thing for them is to walk with the Lord and to love the Lord and stay within that boundary of the will of God. And you'd be surprised... I pray God's blessings on all those people who want to serve God, who want to be used by God. And I want God's blessing. I want you to be happy because you're doing what God says do. And the Holy Spirit brings you great comfort when you obey the Lord. But when you step outside of that boundary, I don't ask God, Lord, comfort them. They're committing adultery. They're on drugs that are ruining their life. Lord, I want you to bless them. No, I don't. I want you to put a hedge of thorns about them so that they'll be pricked in their hearts and their minds and see 
the error of their ways. And that's why I want you to see another verse with me. But look there in the boldness, first of all. What I have, these can be sins that are not unto death because they were confessed and corrected. And I believe that's what 1 John wants us to do. Everybody doesn't always walk perfect. We mess up. But when we mess up, straighten up. When somebody falls, don't put your foot on the back of their head and say, well, you blew it, mash them into the mud. No, we try to pick them up. We want to help them. Because if we don't, then God says, considering it could be you next time. You realize how easy it is to fall? And there are all these problems in life. So look down at the next statement. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. Not everyone that was sick committed the same sin. Not everyone that is weak commits the same sin. Not everyone that dies commits the same sin. Because these committed a certain sin and not the same thing happened. And just because somebody did something and they didn't, nothing happened to them, well, I'm going to do it too. Bad move, bad judgment. Now, in James chapter 5, very quickly, I want you to turn there. The book of James, right after the book of Hebrews, this is in James, page 1310 in your Bible. We have some interesting scriptures that are mentioned here. And they kind of give us a, another idea of the power of prayer. And you'll notice here in the book of James in chapter 5, starting there in uh, uh, verse 13. In verse 13, is any among you afflicted? How many of you feel like you might be in the afflicted area? I'm there. I am there. I have been greatly afflicted. And some of y'all have been going through exactly the same thing. Just another area, another part of your body, but there's problems. And the older we get, they come heaped together. Anyway, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Well, why pray if it can't be resolved, if nothing can happen about it? You may want to pray not so much that the affliction goes away, but you may have the strength and the grace you need to bear the affliction. Because, see, that's something that can be done. That's in the will of God. God cannot just take away everybody's affliction. Now nobody's got any problems. Isn't that great? But then that's contrary to Scripture. Look what else he says. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Well, I can't even sing the opening song we did today. But I anticipate down the road with great joyful anticipation, I'm going to be able to sing again. And I know that will bless your heart. Verse 14, is any sick among you? I bet I don't want to raise a hand on this. That just might include half the church. Is there any sick of him? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That's why we have a Wednesday night prayer service. You want prayer? Come on Wednesday night and give us your request. And, and the people here, everybody here will pray for you. That means you, somebody has to know you're hurting. I've had people say, I was in the hospital and you didn't come to see me. Did, uh, did you tell me you were in the hospital? Well, no, you're a pastor. You're supposed to know. So I have decided that from now on, anybody goes to the hospital, that'll be Bob Gilbert and Bob Brooks' responsibility. <laughs> and we're moving to verse 15. And the prayer of faith. Now, if you have been sick because of sin that you have done against the Lord, and God knows what you've done, and you know what you've done, and you'd be surprised how God can prick your little mind to let you know, you know this is what this is for. I don't believe my heavenly father just spanks me for no reason and then never tells me. I believe God lets you know. And if it's because of sin in your life, you know. You know. You know. It's kind of like that guy that went into the pet store and wanted to find him just the right pet. He walked in, and there was a parrot. And that parrot says, Hey, mister! Look at him. Yeah? He said, You're ugly. So he walked in toward the back. That parrot hollered out, Hey, mister, you're ugly. 
And so the owner came back there and took a hold of that bird, shook him, slapped him around a little bit, says, don't you talk to the customers like that. Don't you ever do it again. Went back to the front. And that mister came back, getting ready to go out the door. And that bird said, hey, mister. He turned and looked at that bird. And that bird said, you know. <laughs> you know. When you do something wrong, you know. You know. And he says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be what? Because if the sickness is because of sin, you can correct the problem. Otherwise, the sickness could take a life. But that's between you and the Lord. But he also says in verse 16, see that word confess? Because if you've done things against somebody and you haven't confessed that sin, maybe even to the person that you wronged and you haven't confessed it, is that right or wrong? Is that a sin? Is it possible that you could get sick from something like that? Could God have the freedom to take you home if you wanted to? And not yet nobody else know the real reason. But you know. You know. And so that's why he says in verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, not everything. Much, but not everything. Some things we can pray for that can never be. There's some things God cannot do and will not do. And that's why he made the statement down here in verse 19. Brethren, if any one of you do err from the truth. So we're talking about believers going astray, living in error. And one convert him. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from what? Death. And shall hide a multitude of sin. Now, that also helps when we apply it to the lost man. Is that we want a man to have eternal life, so you can pray for that. But you see, God can extend a person's life who corrects the problem, but God may not, and you don't know how much time God's going to give you to correct the problem. You don't know where the finish line is. You might have thought you had 30, 40 years, and God just moved that up. Because of your rebellion. I don't, I don't, I'm not God. I don't play Holy Spirit in people's lives. But I know what this book says. And sometimes it scares me to death. Look at the last line on here. That's in bold. All people will die. True? Everybody's going to die. But the question is where are you going? What? When you die. Whether you're lost or whether you're saved. You should know that you have eternal life. Because God doesn't take that away from you. But God can shorten your life because of stiff-necked rebellion to God. So if you want to live a little bit longer and get a little extension of life and a little tranquility of peace in your mind, then realize I need to examine myself and I need to judge myself on how I correct this problem. Confess that thing to the Lord. And God says he'll forgive. And you can have. But you need to forsake the wrong way. It means get back underneath the umbrella of the will of God. Look up here. Let in this hand represent you and me. And this wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. God loves us, but he hates what we do wrong. And everything that I've said this morning, I want you to understand this. Saved or lost, God loves you, but he hates what you do wrong. And so Christians sometimes step outside the will of God. We just got to find out what we're missing out on. You know, can I have more fun doing my will than I can God's will? When I realize that my very life, my very breath, my very heartbeat depends upon God. I don't want to make him mad. Would you? Not me. He has power. And he can take everything away. Even my very life.
God says he loves us, hates our sin. And for us to pay for sin is eternal separation from God in hell. But God loves us and wants us to go to heaven. And to go to heaven, we have to be perfect, no sin. But we all have sinned. We've all come short of God's perfection. God says we cannot save ourselves. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, God in the flesh. Came into this world because he loves us, but he hates our sin. He hates what we've done wrong. And our sin separates us. So Jesus Christ, see, I couldn't do anything about it. But Jesus Christ, who had no sin, took all my sin, all your sins, paid for them on the cross, came back from the dead. And God said if we believe he did it for us, it put this payment to our account, and we get to go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for us. Yesterday I had a man and a woman come all the way from Missouri. Well, not the woman. They had four kids because they listened to us on the YouTube. They came all the way down, and in the office, the two oldest girls, I got to lead to the Lord. He had trusted the Lord about a year ago, and he's a truck driver. But last week we had somebody, or the week before, somebody showed up from um, Nashville that had trusted Christ as Savior. And then after I got off the, the service last Sunday, about 12.02, somebody trusted the Lord from some other state, but I can't remember where it was. It might have been Tampa area, but I can't remember. It's the greatest thing. You know why I want to live long? I enjoy telling the story. If, it, if there's no other reason for telling the story, the Lord, you can take me on now. But I enjoy telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're watching by internet, all you have to do is trust Christ as Savior. And God will give you eternal life. He'll never cast you out and never lose you. It's the gift, totally free. And on the screen it says, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. If you've never done it, I pray that you would. Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. You say, preacher, I don't understand everything. Friend, you may not even agree with all that I said. But understand this, God loves you. So do I. And he wants you to have eternal life and go to heaven, and so do I. But I can't save you, but he can. Would you trust the only true and living God there is? There's no trick to this, but right where you're sitting. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust him right now? I'm going to ask you for a raise of hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you, and you said, Preacher, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. And friend, I'd like to pray for you. Would you just slip in a very quick and say, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior this morning and like you to pray for me. Anyone at all before we close? No at all. With head still bowed, nice flows. Do you understand that as a child of God, you cannot live as you please and get away with it? Impossible. Walk with the Lord. If you're outside of the will of God, you better get back. Let this sermon today serve as a warning. Father, we thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for all you do for us. Pray for good service tonight. In Christ's name, amen.